بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين والعاقبة للمتقين ولا عدوان إلا على الظالمين وأشهد أن لا إله إلا الله إله الأولين والآخرين وأشهد أن محمدا عبده ورسوله عليه أفضل الصلاة وتم التسليم يا أيها الذين آمنوا اتقوا الله حق تقاته ولا تموتن إلا وأنتم مسلمون يا أيها الناس اتقوا ربكم الذي خلقكم من نفس واحدة وخلق منها زوجها وبث منهما رجالا كثيرا ونساء واتقوا الله الذي تساءلون به والأرحام إن الله كان عليكم رقيبا يا أيها الذين آمنوا اتقوا الله وقولوا قولا سديدا يصلح لكم أعمالكم ويغفر لكم ذنوبكم ومن يطع الله ورسوله فقد فاز فوزا عظيما وبعد فإن أصدق الحديث كتاب الله تعالى وخير الهدى هدي محمد صلى الله عليه وسلم وشر الأمور محدثاتها وكل محدثة بدعة وكل بدعة ضلالة وكل ضلالة في النار My respected brothers and sisters in Islam Today we, we have with us a very very beautiful and important topic And that is the history of Andalus And we will inshallah be talking about it in two parts The first lecture inshallah will be on the rise of Andalus And the second one will be about the, about the fall of Andalus Now people say when Muslimin talk about Andalus They are crying over spilt milk But wallahi we don't want to cry over spilt milk Rather we want to discuss Andalus We want to discuss, discuss the history of Andalus In an intellectual manner We want to discuss it trying to find out what went wrong Trying to find out how we took it over And what went wrong And how we lost the greatest city That the world has ever seen on the face of this earth How did we lose uh, 700 libraries of Islamic books How did we lose a mosque in which 12,000 circles were given at a single time 12,000 durus was given at a single time, subhanAllah. How could we ever have lost this? How could we lose pastures of green? How could we lose uh, uh, jannat, you know, uh, uh, gardens which were called jannat because of its vastness, through which rivers flow, through which they built artificial uh, 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 waterfalls, subhanAllah. Such was the, was the grandeur of Spain. How could we have lost the greatest city that this world has ever seen? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us in the Qur'an, فَقَصُصِ الْقَصَصَ لَعَلَّهُمْ يَتَفَكَّرُونَ So relate to them the stories, perhaps that they may think about it. Relate to them the stories of the past, the things that have gone past, perhaps that we may draw some conclusion, some, some lesson from that. Also Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the Qur'an, لَقَدْ كَانَ فِي قَصَصِهِمْ عِبْرَةً لِأُولِي الْأَلْبَابِ Verily, in their, in their stories is a message for you. Is a, is a message for you, all people of understanding, to think about. Think about how Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's sunnah is always, always come into effect. Think about how Allah's adab comes into effect for those who deserve it. And think about how Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's great, great, great blessing comes into effect for those who deserve it as well. From the benefits of learning about history, brothers and sisters in Islam, without doubt, is first of all understanding the sunnah of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And that is to understand how Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala works. What causes Allah to get angry? What causes Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's uh, mercy? What brings about Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's wrath? And what causes uh, 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 Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's great pleasure? What is it that Muslimin have always done in their life and in their history that has caused the downfall of the Muslimin? And what is it that the Muslims have done? What little is it that the Muslims have done that have been the reason for their great good? great glory. And truly in the history of Spain we have a perfect example. Why? Because the history of Spain, brothers, brothers and sisters in Islam, and of course it is, uh, it is, mashallah, what is that brother? <laughs> okay, obviously not, not, uh, not from Spain is it? Okay, uh, truly in, uh, it is a matter which is uh, uh, a, a very pitiful matter. It is a, a, a thing of, of great pity that Muslimin have forgotten the history of Spain. And if you think about it, the history of Spain is two thirds of the Muslim history. Is two thirds of Muslim history. Eight hundred and five years of Muslim history. How can we overlook the history of Spain? Eight hundred and five years of Muslim civilization. Eight hundred and five years of teaching the world. The knowledge that it, that, that it now uses to attack us. 805 years to, to advance every single branch of science. Subhanallah, nowadays we find in uh, you, you know, Western world uh, leading us in certain fields. Wallahi, the Muslimin in their time, they used to, lead them, used to lead Europe in every single branch of science that you can think of. 
until even the kings and queens of Europe used to vie with one another to learn Arabic. Until they used to open their suffers, you know their suffers, their, their dinners, and, and give thanks to their God in Arabic. And they used to open their, their, their dinners with khutbat al haja With khutbat al haja this is the glory of, 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 of Islam that had, had reached the hearts of the people. Until the Jews, until the Zionists, the, the Jews at that time, also learned Arabic, and they actually advanced Judaism through Arabic. And the greatest of the books of the Jews are written in Arabic as well. And until the Jews themselves used to say that, uh, that the Arabic is the best and the most richest language in the world, and how the tables have turned. Nowadays when you go to Saudi Arabia, and when you go to the streets of Jeddah, people uh, uh, think of it as a great pride that they know how to speak English. And they try and speak a little bit of English to you, thinking that, mashallah, wow, I know a Western language. And they are so happy. Whereas, knowing Arabic was a, was a, was a thing of pride amongst the kings and queens of Europe, subhanAllah. <clears throat> My brothers and sisters in Islam, I'm sure you agree that 805 years is a tremendous time in which to uh, realize all the sunnah of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Verily, when you read the history of Spain, and, and the history of Muslims in Spain, you find that all of the sunnah of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, and all of the sunnah of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, in all its, in all its types, in all its effects, are found in Spain. So we find in, in, in Spain the stories of great heroes, and we find in, sto- in, in Spain the story of great cowards. We find in Spain the story of great kings, and we find in Spain the story of great beggars. We find in Spain the history of great and righteous and pious people, and we find in Spain the stories of those people who were overtaken by the fitna women, and all they wrote were copious amounts of books and books about fantasies about women. How they and and they and this is how we find Subhanallah the pious, and we find the not so pious. And so in Spain we find a complete history, a complete book for all of us uh, to go through. And it is a pity that today we Muslims don't read history. We don't learn from the past. Because brothers and sisters in Islam, I'm sure you agree, when you read about history, it is as if you are looking into the future. It is as if you are looking into the future because that which has come in the past will happen again. You know the past repeats itself as the people say. And so when we read about Spain, Wallahi, it is as if we are reading about our day-to-day events. It is as if we are <clears throat> reading about our day-to-day events. Do you know that the massacre that happened in, in Bosnia about 10 years ago, about, uh, what was that, uh, 12 years ago now, or, or more than that, about 12 years ago, there was an example of, that, of, of, of something similar that happened in uh, the same area of, uh, of, of Sarajevo. In the same place, the same massacre happened in the time of, uh, of, uh, uh, of, of the Muslim rule in Spain, wherein 70,000 Muslims were killed, 40,000 women raped, subhanAllah. Were we to read history, wallahi, we could save ourselves from falling into the same traps. But unfortunately, Muslimin have forgotten the history. We all say, mashallah, we are great, and we are truly great, and Muslims were truly great. However, however we, f- we forget the specific examples of how great we truly were, and read about history so that, you know, unfortunately, we end up falling into it. That's why we find people not even, uh, uh, you know, when I ask people, do you know about the Battle of Barket? Do you know about the Battle of Dariya? No, you know, people look at me with a blank face because they don't know uh, uh, the history of, of, uh, of Spain. We, 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 when I ask them about, do you know about the story of Tariq bin Ziyad destroying the ship, his ships? People look at me with a blank face. Do you, when I ask them as well, do you know about Abdul Rahman? Ad-Dakhil, about which the scholars of Islam have said that were it not to be after Allah, for this man, then Spain would have been wiped out. Islam in Europe would have been wiped out for a long, long time. You know, a, a long time ago, before its time, which is in the, in the year 897 after Hijrah. Do you know about Abdul Rahman al-Nasr, who the historians, all of the historians, the Orientalists, the Muslim uh, historians, all of them, all agree that he was the greatest ruler of this earth at that time. The greatest ruler of this earth at that time, and his city was the greatest of cities. We're talking about Qurtuba, uh, it was the greatest of the cities in all of the world at that time. Nothing on this earth could ever match that city and that king in his uh, in his greatness. <clears throat> what about Yusuf ibn, ibn, ibn al Ashbil? As as the ulama have said, he is one of the most righteous and pious mujahideen of uh, of Spain. And what about Abu Bakr ibn Umar al Lantuni? 
Abu Bakr ibn Umar Lantuni, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he was a, uh, an amazing mujahid. 15 countries in Africa he brought Islam to. 15 of the countries, brothers who are Muslims from, uh, from Africa, owe their Islam to this man, Abu Bakr ibn Muhammad Al-Lantuni. Al-Lantuni, wallahi, we have forgotten this great mujahid and this great pious imam. Also, what about Abi Yusuf Yaqub Al-Mansur Al-Marini? One of the greatest scholars of, of this religion. One of, subhanAllah, we will be going through uh, uh, Abi Yusuf Yaqub ibn, ibn Mansur al-Marini's uh, life today, inshallah, in the second session. And we'll be mentioning how this man singly, single-handedly was responsible for fending off the Christian onslaught for 200 years. For 200 years, this man was responsible and, and the action that he did was responsible for, for saving Spain for 200 years. And how this man single-handedly saved the Turat of, of Islam, the literature of Islam, the history, the, the heritage of Islam, by fighting the Christians for only one reason. What was his reason? In order to give back the Muslim books that they had with them. This is the reason why he fought them. So that they could give back what? The books of Muslimin that they had taken, the books of the scholars that they had stolen when they were attacking the Muslim lands. Also, what about uh, when we talk about, for example, Masjid al qurtuba which was the largest mosque ever at that time. The grandest and the largest mosque with 12,000 circles at that time. Each circle having an alim, 12,000 alim with every circle and on the head of every circle. And every, every alim had students with him. SubhanAllah, imagine that, imagine 12,000 circles at a given time. Wallahi, in this mosque of ours, we only have one lesson. And if we had two lessons at the same time, people would get angry. What is that man doing? Why are they, why are they giving lessons? SubhanAllah. But those people, they were so busy, so busy gaining knowledge, knowing that knowledge is power. Knowing that knowledge is power, they were so busy gaining knowledge in all different fields, 12,000 different circles of knowledge. Unbelievable, unbelievable. And in, 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 in Andalus, uh, and, and in Qurtuba by itself, 700 libraries. 700 libraries. Go to any Muslim land now. How many libraries are there? Public libraries, tell me. These are public libraries. You could borrow books there. And <laughs> this, is, this is, subhanallah, you could borrow books. This is Muslim invention. Europe never knew about these things. There were no public libraries at that time. 700 public, public libraries, how did that happen? How were Muslims so forward thinking that they had 700 public libraries in one city? One city, subhanAllah, perhaps even more than London, I don't know. Perhaps even more than London, but each library had more than a, more than a million titles. More than a million titles, imagine that. Imagine how there was so much into gaining knowledge, so much into gaining knowledge. The question, brothers and sisters in Islam, needs to be asked. Why was there a need to open up Andalus? Why did the Muslimin open up Andalus? What was the need for that? Well, once when the Muslims were attacking parts of, of the Roman Empire in Sham, uh, Mu'ad al Jabal was asked by the Roman uh, uh, leader at that time, the, the Roman general, the same question. Why have you come to attack us? Why don't you just go and attack Ethiopia? which is easier upon you. Why don't you go and attack Ethiopia? Why do you come and attack us? We are the Romans, we are strongest, we're one of the strongest nations on this earth. Why do you Arabs, you filthy Arabs coming from the desert with disheveled hair and, and blunt swords and everything, why do you come and attack us? And Mu'ad ibn Jabal, the faqih of this ummah, said that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us in the Qur'an, وَقَاتِلُوا الَّذِينَ يَلُونَكُمْ مِنَ الْكُفَّارِ Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, and fight those who are next to you amongst the disbelievers. Meaning that, meaning that the way the uh, uh, conquest of, of, of Islam or the da'wah of Islam should happen is that da'wah should be proposed or jihad should be proposed to the neighboring cities before any, anyone else. So because you are neighboring to us, so we start with you. Yeah, they didn't care. <laughs> You're the greatest city or not. Wallahi, we don't care. No, we have absolutely no care in the world. You are the strongest, but Allah is stronger. You have a great army, but the armies of Allah are greater. Subhanallah. We don't care. Allah says in the Quran, we start, you know, we start off with, the, with your neighbors, so we start off with you. And this is the same reason why the Muslims started off with Andalus. Because at that time, the Muslims had reached all the way up until Maghrib. So they had taken all of North Africa, which was Egypt, and then uh, Algeria, and Tunisia, and uh, what else is there, and, and, uh, and Morocco. And so they had pushed all the way up until the end of Morocco, until the edge of the of the ocean until it has even been reported that Musa, uh, uh, Musa ibn Nusayr, <coughs> who was the leader uh, uh, at that time from the Tabi'een, who was a mujahid at that time, who opened up 
all these lands. He even went up to the, to the Pacific Ocean, to the Atlantic Ocean at that, on, on, the, on that edge, to the Atlantic Ocean with his horse halfway, you know, uh, uh, until his horse was, was, was almost submerged. And he said, Wallahi, if it was not for this ocean, I would have taken, was, if it was not for this ocean and, and my horse drowning, I would have taken Islam to the ends of this earth. I would have taken Islam to the ends of this earth. Musa ibn Nusayr, his father was Nusayr. And his father and Ibn Sirin, and, and, and Sirin, his father and Sirin were two uh, uh, children who were growing up in the monasteries of, uh, of, of the Christians when Khalid bin Walid opened up Hira. So in Hira they found that there was a city in which there was a monastery, Christian monastery, and in them were two children learning the Torah and learning the Old and New Testaments. And these were Nusair and Sirin. So Khalid bin Walid, he, he told them to accept Islam and they accepted Islam. So from Nusair came Muhammad, the son. Muhammad bin Nusair. And from Sirin came also Muhammad, Muhammad bin Sirin. As everyone knows about Muhammad bin Sirin, who was one of the tabi'een at that time. So Muhammad bin Sirin, he went to Kufa and he stayed there his life. Whereas Musa bin Nusair, he, raised up, he was raised up with Walid, who was the Khalifa, who was the son of the Khalifa at that time. So when the, when the Khalifa died, Walid became the Khalifa of, that, of the Muslimin at that time. Of, obviously that was the Umayyad empire, uh, empire at that time. He became the Khalifa and Walid made his best friend, Musa, his general, his first general. And so Musa was sent to North Africa in order to quell the Berbers that were, that were there at that time. Musa took seven years to conquer North Africa. Whereas, of course, before that, North Africa had already been, been conquered. However, the people were always rebellious, and they would go back. They would, they, they would, they would make a pact with Muslimin, and then they would go back. And so Musa ibn Nusayr, he followed the following way. He followed the following, following methodology. He would take up land slowly, slowly. And as soon as he had taken up a city or a land, he would bring scholars, the tabi'een, and put them there. So the people would learn about religion, and then love the, love the religion until the people themselves would be the army that would go on and fight the next lands. And in this way, he conquered North Africa in seven years. In seven years. And so the Berbers, who were known to be ferocious fighters at that time, became from the enemies of Islam to the helpers of Islam. The Berbers were not, as people think, that they were dark-skinned and, and, and black-haired and all that. No, they were, they were white-skinned, blonde hair, blue eyes. They were blonde hair, <laughs> blonde hair, white skin and blue eyes. And this was how the Berbers were. And they became the great army which will, which will soon conquer Andalus. So Musa started to think in the, year, in the years before the conquest of Andalus. So that is before the year 992 after Hijrah. Before that, he started to think where, where does he want to go. If he, went to go, if, he, if he goes south, and that is Sahara Desert. And there is no benefit in that because they're not, in, in, they're not, they're not after land. What are they after? They're after Sukkan, they're after the people, they want to teach the people about Islam. Right? And so Musa ibn Nusayr, he decided to go up, and of course up is only, is only Andalus at that, at that time. Brothers and sisters in Islam, uh, before I go into why, why and, and, and how uh, Musa ibn Nusayr attacked uh, Andalus, and how he opened up Andalus, I wanted to mention something very important, that is uh, the, the misunderstanding of people about jihad. And you see, first of all, jihad is not as people say peace and harmony and sincerity and this and that. It's just all about peace. No, jihad is of two types. There is the jihad of our difa, which is the, the, the defensive jihad, which, which every logical person on this earth, every person of, 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 of logic would already agree that there is, there is the, the jihad of difa, which is defending ourselves. You know, it's logical. When, when someone tries to fight, you fight him back. When someone wants to fight, you defend yourself. And this is logical, isn't it? And this is the, the jihad of difa. Whereas at that time, it was jihad al dafa which is actually jihad al da'wa as they call it. Which means that the people would try and go to different lands in order to preach Islam to the, to the people. And spread Islam. However, because the kings of that, at, in those lands knew that if people became Muslimin, that they would lose their power. So they were always haughty and proud, and they would always fight the Muslimin. And so... The Muslims got together their armies and they would always seek new lands in order to actually spread Islam. And in this way, Europe, Eastern Europe. What is that noise? Is that a bird? Oh, it's raining. Oh, sorry. Okay. Okay. <laughs> okay. Yeah. In the same way, in this way, by jihad al-dafa, by, by jihad al-talab, by asking for the 
for, 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 the, for the war to happen by, uh, by, by them trying to spread Islam. Islam spread to most of Sham, for example, that, that is parts of Turkey, uh, Lebanon, Jordan, uh, Syria. They were all opened up not by good manners, brothers and sisters in Islam, they were opened up by the sword. And you have most of Africa, 15 nations, all of the nations of, of Africa, all of the nations that were ever opened up were opened up with the sword. And then Eastern Europe, they were opened up with the sword. And also uh, parts, parts of Western Europe, wherever the Muslim were, such as Greece, such as Malta, such as Cyprus, yes, they, were, they used to be Muslim lands at one time. At one time, for centuries, Islam ruled there. Greece, Malta, uh, Yugoslavia, Cyprus, these were all Muslim lands. And, uh, and, and Allah, you, uh, Islam was a, was a predominant religion at that time. They were all opened up with the sword. So sometimes we talk about Malaysia and Indonesia and how they were opened up because of good manners of the Tujjad. However, this is not the case as far as most of the Muslim lands were concerned. Most of the Muslim lands were, concur- were, 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 were conquered with, with jihad. And as you, as you know, the modernists these days, those who try to apologize for Islam on behalf of Islam, they try and make apologies. They say, no, Islam, has, Islam was not spread by the sword. Islam was spread by a smile. But the, but the truth is, no, it was also spread by the sword, by them going to them, saying, either you accept Islam, or you pay the jizya, or you fight. Either one of these three. And this is how Islam was spread. Okay. Uh, we come to Andalus, and what was the state of Andalus before the Muslimin took it over? And Wallahi, in every single one of these uh, things that we take is a lesson for us. The state of Andalus was that the Romans became very weak in Rome, because obviously they were being attacked by the Muslims, and they had internal problems, internal struggles, and Romans became weak wherever they had, they had their forces. And so the Romans in Europe and, uh, had, were, <coughs> were losing their grip upon Spain. At that time, uh, a tribe by the name of Vandals, they came in from the north and they took over Spain and, and, and Andalus at that time. So this is where the word uh, uh, Andalus comes from, basically from the word Vandalus, right? And because they called their land Vandalusia. And you see, they were true to the word. You see, the word Vandals comes from, them, f- comes from this tribe as well. What does Vandal mean in, uh, in English? What does it mean? Vandal, man, he's a vandal. What's, what's a vandal? Yeah, he damages, he pillages. He's a he's a wretched uh, a human being, and he and he's a uh, what is it? He's animalistic, etc. In his behavior, and this is how this tribe were, and that's why they were called vandals, and that's why uh, the description of the, the word English word vandals comes from the, the perfect description of this tribe. This is how they were. They were inhuman in their treatment. They were animalistic in their behavior. And they would pillage and they would conquer and they would rape and they would cut up women. And this is how they were. Until at that time, the, 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 a Christian army came from the north uh, by, by the uh, leadership of, uh, of Roderick. And these were the Visigoth, uh, Visigoth uh, uh, Christians that took over uh, Andalus at that time, which is Vandalus at that time. They took over Andalus, uh, Vandalus. And so they were the army and they were the dominant power at the time when the Muslims attacked. And Musa ibn Nasr, we come back to Musa ibn Nasr uh, ibn Nusayr, who was the imam in Maghrib. And Maghrib, of course, at that time cons- consisted of everything of North Africa. Egypt, Tunisia, uh, uh, Algeria, and, uh, and, and Morocco. And so all of this was Maghrib in, 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 in the Muslim empire at that time. So Musa ibn Nusayr, he was the leader and the khalifa and, and, the, and the representative of the khalifa at that time. So he decided to think, how am I going to pass the Straits of Gibraltar? How am I going to pass the Straits of Gibraltar, which is approximately 13 miles, miles in distance? So basically, from the highest tip of Africa, which is Septa, until the bottom tip of, uh, of uh, Spain, which is, Mount, which, is, which is the Mount of Gibraltar, is about 13 miles. How is he going to cross this? And then he thought, obviously, the way he's going to cross it is by building ships. So he started to, uh, uh, to, to, to build ships. And he started to ask his, uh, his people, and he set up small harbors in order to build ships. However, it was a difficult task. It was a very, very difficult task because the land at that time was very, very rocky, and was not possible to find good places to harbor. But because Musa ibn Nusayr was such a righteous man, and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala helps his slaves. You see, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the Quran, in Allah yansurukum. If you help Allah, Allah will help you. So because Musa ibn Nusayr was a helper of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, so Allah helped him. How did Allah help him? Well, in the year uh, 91 after Hijrah, in the year 91, this is the, the year before Andalus is to be conquered. In the year 91 after Hijrah, Julian who was the leader of Septa, and Septa was, a, was the harbor city, which is the closest thing to 
Spain at that, at that time, okay, the harbor city which is on the top of Africa at that time. Julian, he sent his, his daughter, Julian obviously he was Christian, he sent his daughter to, uh, to Roderick who was the king of Spain at that time in order to, 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 to study with him, in order to study with the monks over, over, at that time. Uh, over there. However, because she was a very pretty woman, Roderick, he couldn't keep her, keep her hands off her and he raped her. What did he do? He raped her. So Julian got very angry. And he knew that Roderick had to be taught a lesson. But he couldn't do it himself because all he, all he had was a small city. So he sent an emissary to Musa the Nusayr and said, Oh Musa, I will give you the ships. Because obviously he was a harboring city. So he had all the ships that the Muslims needed. I will give you all the ships. And I will give you some armor. And I will give you X, Y, Z. Everything that he needed. And only thing I want was some lands. He just wanted some lands when Andalus was conquered. And Musa bin Nusayr, he fell down prostrating to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. This was the victory he was asking for. He was, this was the victory he was asking for. Because the Muslim armies could not at- attack Septa because of, of its location. They were not able to take over Septa. So Septa was the only link to really attacking Andalus. And see how Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala just gave it to him as a gift. And all this man wanted was some lands. And the Muslims were easy, ha- happy to give him lands. It was not lands that they wanted. It was to spread Islam. That is what they wanted. And so, in the year 91, Walid who was the Khalifa of the Muslims at that time. He told Musa bin Nusayr to not attack in one go, however, to send an, 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 uh, an envoy uh, off to Spain to, to just check out, to see how the territory of Spain is. And so, an envoy went and they, and, it, and they checked out Spain and came back and informed Musa bin Nusayr what was the territory and how the terrains were. With that, Musa bin Nusayr, he formed the army of the Muslimin. And his army consisted of the general by the name of Tariq bin Ziyad, the great hero of Islam by the name of Tariq bin Ziyad. Tariq bin Ziyad was blonde. He was white. He had blue eyes. Imagine this, like for example, Abdurrahim Green, being the general for example. Everyone knows Abdurrahim Green, right? Blonde. White and uh, he doesn't have blue eyes, but then let's say blue eyes. And this is how Tariq bin Ziyad was, the great general of, of, of Islam. And he was a Berber and, and he made his army from the Berbers and he got on the ships and he went off to Spain uh, and, and, and he landed there. Over there he took over some of the cities, some of the harboring cities. And he took over these cities. When he took over these cities, these cities sent an emissary, a messenger to King Roderick who was living in the middle of Spain and who was ruling over Spain, and lived in the middle of Spain, and he sent um, an, an emissary to King Roderick and said, and this emissary, subhanAllah, it is reported in the books of history, that this emissary came to King, to king Roderick and said, oh, oh great king, we are being attacked with a, for, for, uh, for, by a people from the sky. And the king said, what, what do you mean? We are being attacked with a people from the sky. And the king would not understand, so explain yourself, man, what do you mean? And they said, wallahi, at night they, they, they pray like priests. And in the morning, they fight like lions. So they can't be human. They are people from the sky. And wallahi, this is how the Muslims were. At night, they would be beseeching Allah for a victory, praying to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, even though the whole morning, they were fighting like lions. Fighting from the morning until the night subhanAllah. This is how the Muslim world, this is how they were able to open up the world. This is how we are now so proud nowadays and say subhanAllah, look how great the Muslims were. It was because of this ibadah, of this, this worship of this slave of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, these slaves of Allah, who used to be priests at night, whereas they were monks at night, whereas they were subhanAllah, fighters and warriors in the morning. How can the kuffar ever, how will the uh, disbelievers ever succeed? How can they ever succeed against this army? 7,000 in number, so they gathered on the plains uh, 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 in order to fight against the, the forces that King Roderick had amassed. And they heard, the Muslims, uh, Tariq bin Ziyad, heard that the Muslims, that King Roderick had amassed a huge army. A huge army. He didn't know how much. So he just uh, sent, an, sent a messenger back to Musa bin Usair in Maghrib and said, Oh Musa, we need some help. So Musa sent 5,000 uh, soldiers. And that's all he could have at that time. So he said, how much? 5,000 soldiers. So the number of Muslim army was at that time, how much? 12,000. 12,000. And with that, Tariq bin Ziyad approached the battlefield. Tariq bin Ziyad approached the battlefield. King Roderick, he was very, very haughty and proud. He was a, a man who knew, who thought that Allah had guaranteed, who thought that victory was, was a guaranteed, was guaranteed. So he came with his great throne. The people, the peasants and the slaves were carrying his great throne that was studded in jewels. And they, and they had the most richest, full of gold, a throne made of gold studded with, with, with precious gems. 
this is how King Roderick came. And he, as historians also narrate, that he bought a lot of, lot of donkeys with him. And when he asked, why did you bring all the donkeys? He said, because when we conquer the Muslims, I'm going to take the, uh, uh, tie the slaves to my donkeys and make them roam across my, my, my territories to show them how we are so great and how we have defeated the Muslims and how petty they are. And that's why he actually bought so many donkeys, hundreds and hundreds of donkeys uh, in order to, uh, 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 to, to try and fight the Muslimin. And subhanAllah, because of his kibble, Allah was to give him the lesson of his life. Allah was to give him the lesson of his life. So Tariq bin Ziyad, it has been reported in certain books that when he saw 90,000 or 100,000 Christians in front of him, 100,000 Christians in front of him, what did he do? He told his people to burn the ships. He said to, he told his people to burn the ships. Why? So, so that people know that there is no way out. There is either victory or death. There is either victory or death. The Muslim historians did not report this event. The Muslim historians don't report this event. It is only the Orientalists who report this event. So we don't know truly whether it is, whether it is a true event or not. And there are some doubts about its authenticity. But whatever, whatever the reason, Tariq bin Ziyad didn't turn back. And the Muslims never turned back. And they pressed on. And they were at the battlefield about to start one of the greatest wars that was ever to be recorded in history. That was ever to be recorded in history. My question to you before uh, I go on to the battle is this question, brothers and sisters in Islam. Which party do you feel sorry for? Which one do you feel sorry for? Do you feel sorry for the Muslims who are 12,000 in number? Or do you feel sorry for the 100,000? 100, why, brother, why? Why? That is so illogical, why? <laughs> for surely Allah is with the righteous. So, uh, you know, I, I mean, because I know history, and that's what happens, and that's probably why. Oh, mashallah. See, you shouldn't have read the history, so I could have tested you a little bit. But anyway, alhamdulillah. <laughs> Truly, brothers and sisters in Islam, we don't feel sorry for the Muslims. <laughs> why should we feel sorry for them, even though they are less in number? They have armies from the heavens coming down to aid them. Whereas these people, they have nothing except their own swords. Wallahi, the Muslims have a Rabbani, and an Imam, a, a fighter, and a Mujahid, and a, and a pious man leading them, Tariq bin Ziyad. Whereas the disbelievers have a haughty king who will lash the people if they do not, if they do not fight. And who will, after the, after the battle, take all the, all the winnings to, for himself. And he has... Uh, 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 put, put taxes upon the people in order to fund the war. This is how the king was. And they are being led by this king. How can they ever be equal? <laughs> Shall we ever make the mujrimin, the muslimin, like the mujrimin, like those who are evildoers? <laughs> what is wrong with you that you do not understand? How do you judge? How do you judge? So how can we ever feel pity for the other one? Wallahi, we have 12,000 people here who as Khalid bin Walid rahimahullah had said, جِئْتُكَ بِقَوْمٍ يُحِبُّونَ الْمَوْتَ كَمَا تُحِبُّ الْحَيَاةِ As Khalid bin Walid said about the, about the Muslim warriors, they said, I have come to you with a people who love to die like you love to live. Whereas those people, they love to live and they hate to die. The 100,000, they love to live and they hate to die. And the only reason that they bought them there was because their nobles, if they, did, if they didn't bring them, would lash their backs and take their wealth away and, 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 and rape their women if they did not come and fight. This was the only reason they were coming to the battle. So how do you think, how can, how can, how can the two armies ever be equal? They cannot be equal. And that is why Muslims were in a better place, better situation, even though they were 12,000 in number. And so the battle started. Six days it lasted. And on the sixth day, the Muslims won. On the sixth day, the Muslims won. Roderick died. Most of the Christians were, were killed. Most of the Christians in that battle were killed. The sons of Roderick were, were, were killed. Roderick himself fled or he died. And, and from the Muslims, only a few in number died. Only a few in number died. And Muslimin had the whole of Andalus open to them. Because now the king had fallen. There was nothing left on their way. And so city after city, city after city, Tariq bin Ziyad pressed on until he took over all of Spain. And later on he pushed on, pushed on into parts of Europe as well. In this way, Muslims had taken over all of the city. And the people, what was more interesting was that the people did not rebel. The people who were there at that, in those cities, the Christians and the Jews, did not rebel. Because they found the Muslims more trustworthy they found the Muslims true to their word, whereas these Christian uh, 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 kings were not true to their word. They would always break their treaties. 
They will always break the treaty. So why would they ever go against the Muslims? They would actually prefer the Muslims to be their leader rather than the non-Muslims. And now I read to you certain things which the uh, historians of, of, the, of the disbelievers have written. I will mention to you what the Muslim historians have written, but just listen to what the, the historians of the disbelievers have written about the greatness of Andalus and how the victory of Tariq bin Ziyad paved the way for a new chapter in civilization. We have Stanley Lane Poole, which is, uh, 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 which is the author of the book, The Moors in Spain. He writes in his introduction, For nearly eight centuries under the, under the Mohammedan rule, Spain set all Europe a shining example of a civilized and enlightened state. Her fertile provinces, rendered d- doubly prolific by the industrious engineering skill of the conquerors, and it bore fruit uh, a-, a hundredfold. Cities innumerable sprang up in the rich valleys in the Guadavir and the Guandiana, whose names and names only commemorate the vanished glories of the past. To Cordoba belong all the beauty, Urtoba basically, and that's Cordoba. To Cordoba belong all the beauty and ornaments that delight the eye or dazzle the sight. Her long line of sultans form her crown of glory. Her necklace is strung from the pearls which her poets have gathered from the ocean of language. Her dress is the banners of, of learning, well knit together by her men of science and the masters of every art and industry are the hem of her garments. Art, literature and science prospered as they then prospered nowhere else in Europe. Mathematics, astronomy, botany, history, philosophy and jurisprudence were to be mastered in Spain and Spain alone. Whatever makes the kingdom great and prosperous, whatever tends to refinement and civilization was found in Muslim Spain. And we find S.P. Scott in the history of the Moorish Empire in Europe, he writes, Yet there were knowledge and learning everywhere except in Catholic Europe. At a time when even kings could not write or read, a Moorish king, a Moorish basically the Muslim king, a Moorish king had a private library of 600,000 books. At a time when 99% of the Christian people were wholly illiterate, the Moorish city of Cordoba had 800 public schools. And there was not a village within the limits of the empire where the blessings of education could not be enjoyed by the children of the most indigent peasant. And it was difficult to encounter even a Moorish peasant who could not read or write. Unbelievable, isn't it? And they say that we are against education. They say we are against teaching women, subhanAllah. Thompson in his Muslims in Andalusia, he writes, Europe was darkened at sunset. Cordova shone with public lamps. So when Europe was darkened at sunset, Cordova shone with public lamps. They actually have public lamps, unbelievable. Europe was dirty, whereas Cordova built a thousand baths. Cordova changed its undergarments daily. People and in Europe lay in the mud. Cordova streets were paved. Europe's palaces had smoke holes in the ceiling. Cordova's Arabics were exquisite. Europe's nobility could not sign its name. Cordova's children went to school. Europe's monks could not read the baptismal service. It's unbelievable, subhanAllah, when you read about it and the greatness of Spain, and it had left everyone behind, everyone behind, so far ahead, is unbelievable. And Cordova's teachers created a library of Alexandrian dimensions. And these are just, uh, brothers and sisters in Islam, these are just, subhanAllah, uh, glimpses at the greatness of Spain. Glimpses at the greatness of, of, of Spain. Wallahi, subhanAllah, wallahi, if you were to go to Al-Hamra, and these are the palaces of Spain, and you were to go to the to the vast gardens that they that they still try to preserve, you are amazed at the beauty of their creation. You are amazed at how their architecture was so great. You are amazed at how in every single branch of science they had pioneering books, which even to now they are they are preserved as as evidences of of, uh, of human achievements. Subhanallah. Allah Taala Alam. Allah knows best. However, when Spain was taken from us, it was truly a loss to humanity. When Spain was taken and the Muslims were, were, were thrown out of Spain, truly it was not just a loss to Islam, but it was a loss to humanity. And Muslims and, 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 and humanity itself lost one of its greatest assets, and these were the Muslims. And this is what the world has lost, has lost by the downfall of Muslims. They have lost a lot of honor, they have lost knowledge, they have lost uh, 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 greatness in every single field, they have lost masters in every single field, they have lost... A lot of respect, as we will take inshallah in the next lesson, you will see how the world has truly fallen apart after the coming of, 
of uh, of the Christians into Spain. How, wallahi, when the Christians when the Christians threw out Muslims in large numbers and they pillaged Muslims and they raped hundred thousand women and they and they killed millions of of of, of Muslimin. How, when they actually did that and they actually banished millions of Muslims away from Spain, wallahi, victory was not for anyone except for the Muslims and defeat was for no one except except for the Christians. Because truly when the Muslims left Spain, Spain ceased to be the leader of the world. Spain ceased to be leaders of the world. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala